Hello everyone, welcome back. Today, uh, with this video, I'm trying to explain to you Lanay et al. study on false memory. The title of the paper is Asparagus, a love story, healthier eating could be just a false memory away. This is a part of AS level psychology, Cambridge International Syllabus 9990. Um, and I believe this is the lengthiest experiment that you have under the syllabus. So without wasting any time, let's get to that. Also, let me please remind you to give the video a thumbs up and please, please subscribe for more similar videos. Now, let me first try and explain to you a thing or two about memory. First of all, memory can be incorrect. Distortion to memories can happen at so many levels. Even though people do not intend to do it, many people try to bring an old memory to the front, um, new events can be added to it. Or in other words, when people try to retrieve memory from long-term memory and bring into short-term memory, people tend to alter uh, their and modify um, them and sometimes by mixing it up with new memories. Researchers have even successfully planted false memories in people's head. One important person in this field who studies the malleability of human memory is Elizabeth Loftus. Through her research, she has shown that exposing someone to incorrect information can sometimes lead to misremembering the original event, and this is called the, the misinformation effect. Also, it is not only possible to plan false details to actual events, one can even plan impossible events into your memory through suggestion. Suggestibility is the effect of misinformation from external sources that leads to the creation of false memories. Even though all of this is true, police officers, prosecutors, and the court often relies on eyewitness identification and testimony in the prosecution of criminals. I found this article by Chris French, um, which was published in The Guardian, in which he says how so many hundreds of people have been wrongfully convicted in the UK because of relying on such memory accounts. Saying that, let's look at the background of the study by Lanay et al. So they did few studies before this one where they created a memory in subjects that they have gotten sick after eating hard-boiled egg or dill pickle. And eventually the subjects showed lesser liking for this food. In the later research, they even planted a memory of falling sick eating a fattening food and eventually they reported avoidance of this food. So they were like, hey, if, if you can make someone avoid a certain food by creating a false belief of a negative experience, can you also create a positive false belief about a food and make them want to eat it more? So for the first time, they tested false beliefs for positive events. Few implications of this um, study are that first, this would demonstrate if it is possible to implant a, a, a positive false belief and memories in people. And if it is possible, it can be you know, utilized in treating some disorders like PTSD or general anxiety disorder or things like that. And you can also use this to develop healthy eating habits or even reverse aversion to food that occurs mostly after chemotherapy in cancer patients. So uh, these are some of the benefits that the researchers, um, you know, themselves recognize. So to conduct the study... Uh, they have chosen asparagus, which the children, um, you know, are generally not very fond of. And they are trying to implant memories of loving asparagus as a child and thereby uh, have a positive consequence to this belief. Right. So, you know, um, there are two parts to this experiment, which are mentioned uh, in the study as experiment one and two. Now let's start with experiment one. Um, so there were 128 subjects um, involved in this study and all of them were undergraduate students at the University of California. And one thing that you should keep in mind um, is that this study involved deception. Uh, participants were never told that the study is about false memory. Instead, they were told that they are studying food 
preferences and personality and they will be completing a series of questionnaires for this. Now, this is what happened. So once participants came to the lab, they were asked to fill uh, a food history inventory which contained 24 items. Uh, so these contained statements, uh, 24 statements, and to be exact, the 16th one was what we were interested in. It said, loved asparagus the first time you tried, okay? And participants were supposed to rate them on a scale of 1 to 8, 1 being definitely did not happen, and 8 being definitely happened, okay? Subjects then completed a restaurant questionnaire, and this one contained 32 separate dishes and one of these items um, was called the critical item because that is what we were interested in. It was sauteed asparagus spears. So, and the subjects, they were supposed to rate all of these dishes based on how much they desired to order these items in a restaurant setting, okay? regardless of their price. Now, they had to measure, um, I mean, they had to rate it on a scale of 1 to 8, 1 being definitely no, and 8 being definitely yes. So these were the two main questions that we were actually interested in. But just to disguise them, uh, you know, just to disguise the true nature of the experiment, uh, another three filler questionnaires were included uh, in the study, which was one was a personality questionnaire, the other one was a subset of a social desirability questionnaire, and also another one that measured eating habits. Okay, so this was just as it is, guys. So what happened then is that the participants, they came back to the lab after one week of filling up all these questionnaires. And when they came back, they were told that, hey, we entered all these questionnaires that you filled into a computer and it has generated a profile of your childhood experience with food, okay? Um, so now, the thing with this profile is that it was tailor-made for the participants, for all the participants, but there were a few things that were, few statements that were similar for all of them, okay? It included enjoyed fried food, disli uh, disliked spinach, and felt happy about friends bringing sweets to school. These three things, it was same for all of the participants, okay? And only the experimental group had another item, which is also the critical item, which said loved asparagus as a child. So the control group had all the other three statements except loved asparagus, and the experimental group had this critical item in it, okay? Just the experimental group. So this whole process is called the manipulation, okay? This whole, um, you know, and altering the profile and, you know, adding a critical item to just the experimental group, this process is called uh, the m manipulation, right? Uh, this is an important step and what you do next is um, called the elaboration exercise where you are asking the person to imagine the things that is there on your profile and you have to imagine where you were when it happened, who were you with when it happened and how much do you think it has affected you um, as an adult or how much it has affected your adult personality. So this phase, this elaboration exercise comes right after the manipulation. So just remember that. Now, moving on, after this manipulation phase, you have to do the food history inventory and the restaurant questionnaire, which you already did before the manipulation once again. All right. So post manipulation, you have to do two of these uh, questionnaires once again. And in addition, you have to do other two questionnaires, which are food preference questionnaire and food cost questionnaire, okay? So you have additional questionnaires. This food preference questionnaire basically has two, uh, you know, 62 food items in there. 
and one of which will contain asparagus. And the participants are supposed to rate them based on a scale of one to eight, one being definitely don't like to eat it, eight definitely like to eat, okay? And the food cost questionnaire will contain 21 grocery items in it, which will also have a pound of asparagus as one of the items, which we'll call, yeah, the critical item. Now, they'll have seven different prices, and you have to choose how much you are willing to pay for this particular item, right? So the final component or the final questionnaire um, is memory or belief questionnaire. So what this basically means is uh, three items from FHI or the food history inventory will be taken, one of which will be the critical item, uh, which we are interested in. Uh, loved asparagus the first time you tried, okay? And you have to answer whether they have a specific memory of the event in their head or do they just believe that this event had occurred but do not have a specific memory of it or the third one that they are positive that it did not happen right so if they believe that this mem they have a specific memory in their head or even if they have a belief that it occurred it means that the suggestion really worked right? That's what it shows. So here, what you have to know is the difference between memory and belief, okay? Memory is a specific unit that might have some details attached to it, while belief is, belief is just that you know it, but you can't be specific about, uh, you know, about it or would not be able to specify when or where it happened. You just know it, all right? So that's the difference between those two. Uh, so if a person has a specific memory or belief that the event has occurred. In both cases, it means that the suggestion that we gave or the manipulation that we gave worked. Now, uh, so keeping this in mind, let's see how they analyzed experiment one. Uh, the two main research questions that they tried to answer were, did subjects form a false asparagus-related belief? Or in other words, do they actually believe that they loved asparagus? And the second question was, did they, they, this belief have consequences or did they change their later responses to asparagus uh, in any way? Did they start to prefer it more after the manipulation? So these are the questions that they wanted to address. Um, now, let's move on to the analysis and results they found. Looking at the critical item in FHI, or the food history inventory. Before manipulation, it is similar for both groups, that is for both control group and experimental group. Um, but since the study is looking at the effect of false beliefs, people who already loved asparagus as a child were discarded. That is common sense, isn't it? Now, but what they found is that after manipulation, the two groups showed significant difference. That is, more people felt that they loved asparagus the first time they tried um, after the manipulation. So this graph right here, it's taken from the article and it clearly shows that change that happened in session two. Now, how about memories and beliefs questionnaire uh, that was given post-manipulation? They found that the love group or the experimental group had more number of people who had a memory or believed that they loved asparagus compared to the control group. But it was not really significant enough a difference, but it was in the direction that we wanted. Okay, so people in the experimental group had, you know, more um, memory of love and asparagus and more uh, you know, had more belief that they loved asparagus compared to the control group after manipulation. We only gave it after manipulation, so yeah. Um, now, they analyzed the difference between believers and non-believers, okay? Let's see who these are. Who are believers and who are non-believers? Believers are people who initially gave a very low score in FHI and said that no, 
you I never liked uh, asparagus before or like close to that and then later during the manipulation they felt like hey I loved asparagus so much so people who actually change their answer after manipulation are the ones who uh, you know showed that belief that in whom this suggestion actually worked right this manipulation worked in those people they are also those people who scored high um, in the memory belief questionnaire as well so these are the two criteria for them to be uh, a believer one thing you should keep in mind is that they have completely excluded non-believers from the analysis clearly they have resisted any suggestion therefore they have looked only at the difference between believers and control group uh, while analyzing the consequences of beliefs. Uh, let's look at the restaurant questionnaire first. Uh, it had 32 dishes and the subjects had to rate them based on their desire to order it in the restaurant despite the price. Um, they found that believers desire to eat the critical item post manipulation significantly more than the control group. So two things to be noted here is that believers desired um, asparagus item more than the control groups and also the believers rating increased from pre to post as well as um, as well unlike uh, that happened in the control group so a repeated measures ANOVA was done to find that these differences uh, that is between the believers and the control group was significant enough right now let's look at the additional questionnaires that we gave post manipulation uh, one was food preference questionnaire, which showed that believers preferred asparagus items significantly more than the control group. And the food co cost questionnaire as well showed a similar result. While doing a man with knee U test, they, they found that believers were willing to pay significantly more for a pound of asparagus when compared to the control group. Okay. Now, following this experiment, other questions came into the front. That is... What is the underlying mechanism behind this change? Would the very side of asparagus be more appealing to the subjects now? So for, for experiment two, they replicated experiment one. And as an extension to it, they wanted to see how subjects would respond to the mere sight of asparagus. Okay. So for this study, they used one, not three undergraduates uh, from the U University of Washington. 62% of them were females, which is a little over half the number. These subjects were allocated into two groups, the love group or the experimental group and uh, two control group. 58 and 45 subjects respectively, uh, which is also not an equal number. Um, but the session one, they were told uh, that their data would be entered into a computer and it would generate a profile unlike an experimental experiment one where they were told that it is to see their food preference and personality or something like that so nothing like that was told to them they were just told that your data will be entered into a computer to generate a profile just like um, experiment one fhi uh, food a history inventory was given with uh, the critical item uh, loved asparagus the first time you tried it also the restaurant questionnaire was given just like uh, experiment one uh, and unlike experiment one we also gave food preference questionnaire uh, before manipulation okay now, in the experiment two, the filler questionnaires to disguise the true purpose were a personality questionnaire and also Marlowe Crown social desirability scale, the whole of it. In experiment one, uh, they used three fillers, uh, the personality questionnaire and only a subset of this, this um, social desirability scale and also another one that was about eating habits. But in this one, it is only just two. Uh, just like with experiment one, subjects came back after one week's time and they had prepared a tailor-made profile for them with certain statements that were common for all, but the experimental group 
um, or the love group had the statement loved asparagus the first time you ate it in the third position and controls were told nothing about asparagus just like in experiment one now they did an elaboration exercise after this just like experiment one but it was much more elaborate than experiment one uh, they did an, uh, they were asked at what age did it happen where did it happen what were they doing at this time who were who were, who was they who were they with and how did it make them feel so clearly more questions than experiment one and apart from this they completed an additional exercise where they answered the question what is the most important childhood food related memory in your life um that is not presented in the profile that is given to you and please explain okay so this was the elaboration exercise and clearly it is much more elaborate than it was in experiment one now the participants were shown a series of 20 photographs of common foods like pizza spinach strawberries etc and of course the critical item asparagus each picture was displayed for about 30 seconds during this time they rated each photo uh, based on how appetizing it is, how disgusting it is, or how artistically this picture is taken. So these three questions they answered on a scale of 1 to 8, 1 being not at all, and 8 being very much. And the fourth question was, who took the photograph? A novice person, an amateur person, or an expert? So participants would answer these four questions um, on each of the photograph and we'll move on to the next step which is same as experiment um, one three questionnaires food history inventory uh, restaurant questionnaire and food preference questionnaire uh, were repeated uh, once again post manipulation and um, the memory or belief questionnaire is done once again just like an experiment one now, once everything was done, they were debriefed before they left the lab. Now, finally, it's time to look at the results. Looking at the FHI score, 30 participants were discarded um, as they already loved asparagus before the manipulation. So it's not going to help us in any way. So those were discarded. Uh, the mean confidence of love group increased drastically uh, from 1.70 to uh, 4.20 post manipulation and the mean confidence of control group only increased from 1.45 to 2.52 which is not so much right now looking at memories and beliefs questionnaire it was found that people in love group had more memories and beliefs than the control group but just like in experiment one it there was no statistically significant difference between these two now, believers and non-believers meant the same thing, just like an experiment one. Uh, 21 out of 40 people qualified to be believers, and the confidence of believers increased from 1.95 to 6.48 uh, from pre to post manipulation, uh, while, which is a drastic uh, change. And while for non-believers, it was very negligible um, you know, change. Uh, let's look at how consequences of false beliefs uh, were analyzed. Just like in experiment one, they completely excluded the non-believers from the analysis as they resisted suggestion. Uh, to analyze this, they have used restaurant questionnaire, food questionnaire, and photograph rating. Now, uh, looking at food preference questionnaire, which was administered both pre and post manipulation it was clear that believers reported more desire to eat food with asparagus after manipulation when compared to the control group and while looking at restaurant questionnaire which was also administered both pre and post manipulation there was not much change as in there was not much significant change in the ratings uh, between pre and post now finally with the photograph rating uh, believers rated asparagus photo as more appetizing and less disgusting when compared to uh, control group both in terms of expertise or artistic quality believers 
and controls did not rate it any different. With this, they came to a conclusion that subjects can be both given positive false food beliefs, and these beliefs have consequences. They also concluded that the mere sight of asparagus was sufficient enough to induce people to rate asparagus positively. So this was the conclusion that they came, uh, came up with. Uh, with this, uh, we are coming to the end of this video. I hope this video helped and I uh, will be back with more interesting topics next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.